Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Falling Home by Libby Kay. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter one. Ginny Meyer glanced at her phone for the third time in two minutes. Was time standing still? From her spot in the rental car line, she knew it would be another five minutes before she got to the front. An elderly woman in an ugly Christmas ensemble stood perched on the edge of the counter, explaining all the reasons she could not drive a stick shift. Once again, Ginny looked at the time and grimaced. She promised her dad she'd be on the road an hour ago. After taking a cleansing breath, Ginny took in her surroundings. Despite the fact that most people were still digesting their Thanksgiving leftovers, the rental store had already decked the halls. Tiny wreaths hung in front of each kiosk and tinny Christmas carols filtered through the overhead speakers. As a girl, Jenny had loved Christmas. The traditions, the movies, the presents, the cookies covered in edible glitter. Christmas brought back some of her favorite childhood memories. Christmas also brought one of the most painful memories of her life, especially since she was mere hours away from facing her past head on. Nope, she would save the soul searching for the road to Ohio. Right now, in New York, she had enough to handle, starting with the festive troublemaker in front of her. You, you see, dear, the woman said over the barrier at the kiosk, I, I asked for a different car. The clerk bit her lip and forced a professional smile. Yes, ma'am. As I said, we can give you a compact car, but it won't be in the evergreen color. All we have available is black. The elderly woman leaned back on her heels as if driving a black car was grounds for a nervous breakdown. But, but dear, it's Christmas time. I can't show up in Pennsylvania in something that isn't festive. To punctuate her point, she waved down at her dress. Santa himself couldn't have designed a more festive frock. Red and green stripes covered the older woman from neck to knees. A candy cane wrapped in twinkle lights would be more tasteful. Ginny stifled a groan as the clerk nodded and asked a manager to assist her. Ginny didn't see what all of us was about. A car was a car. Who cared if it was green, black, or purple? Behind her, another customer cleared his throat and gestured as, at his watch with an expression that was anything but jolly. Oh, we all have places to go, he mumbled loud enough for the older woman to hear. Pulling herself to her full height of barely five feet, the older woman stomped back to the man and pointed with a gnarled finger. Young man, I would appreciate some patience and kindness. You will get your turn as soon as I'm finished. There's no need to be rude this close to Christmas. She nodded at her words and turned before he could respond. His jaw was still cemented to the floor after his dressing down. Ginny hazarded a glance over her shoulder and saw the man was as red as the woman's sweater. Apparently, no one wanted to get scolded by Mrs. Claus in public. Fifteen minutes later, Ginny was behind the wheel of her rental car. It turns out the rental company didn't have evergreen cars available, but the woman got a sedan in cherry red. Ginny took the black car and was happy to be out on the road. Living in New York City meant she rarely drove herself anywhere, so she relished the feel of the open road and minimal traffic once she made it to the highway outside city limits. Granted, she couldn't get to Indy 500 speeds, but Jenny settled for going above 55 miles per hour. Pushing the controls on the steering wheel, Jenny tried to find a radio station that wasn't playing Christmas carols, but it was no use. Every station had a jingle bell, Rudolph, or a crooner lamenting his blue Christmas. She had enough and stabbed the radio off with her thumb. I don't need any music. It's only, uh, her words stalled as she calculated the length of her solo journey. Um, 10 hours? She asked the empty car. Clicking the car's GPS alerted her that nearly 10 hours waited for her. It might be impossible to avoid the holiday hoopla on the airwaves. By the time she reached her first toll booth, Jenny had given up the fight. She plugged her phone into the console and found a true crime podcast to fill her time. Who needed old St. Nick when you could have serial killers and nightmarish tales to fill the void? When she was halfway through Pennsylvania, Jenny's stomach growled so loud she barely heard the details of the investigation. With a pat to her rumbling belly, she pulled over to a small diner for a quick bite to eat. As soon as she stepped out of the car, she realized her mistake. While the building didn't look anything like her ex's restaurant, it had the same smell and atmosphere. Jenny shuddered as she opened the door and inhaled the aroma of fries, still coffee, and bleach. A chipper hostess in a blue uniform and holding a handful of menus greeted Jenny. Hiya, she beamed. Just one today? Pinned to the young woman's uniform was a Grinch pin and a Christmas wreath flashing green and red. 
Ginny thought about the older woman from the car rental store. These two were quite the festive pair. Ginny bobbed her head. Uh, can I order something to go? The hostess nodded and handed her a menu. Have a seat at the counter, she said over her shoulder. I'll swing by for your order in a second. Ginny did as she was told and perched herself on the end of a stool. Her jeans slid on the vinyl material and she felt her feet stick to the floor. Flicking the menu open, Ginny decided a wrap would be the easiest thing to eat while driving. Miss, I'm ready to order, she waved at the girl as she walked past with a pitcher of coffee. Can I have the chicken wrap and a large coffee? Nodding, the waitress sashayed past to place the order. Want a piece of pie with that? We make the best shoe fly pie you'll ever have. Ginny didn't doubt it, but her appetite wasn't ready for sweet desserts. Over two years living in the city had shown her that her pants size varied greatly when home-baked desserts were available. She declined the pie and turned her attention back to her phone. There were a few, a few texts from work inquiring how long she would be on leave. Another text from her dad saying he was excited to see her and would have a late dinner ready. Ginny replied that she was five hours away and dinner would be great. Her father loved to cook when she was in town and she knew he was waiting to flex his culinary muscle. Her texts from work were harder to answer. Ginny didn't have an end date for her visit back to Buckeye Falls and that scared her to death. Since moving away, she had made a point to plan her visits around an event. In this case, it was her father's hip surgery. He wouldn't be able to care for himself for a few weeks and Ginny couldn't stomach him relying on strangers for help. He was her father. It was her responsibility. The biggest reason she wasn't ready to go to Buckeye Falls had everything to do with the diner she was currently sitting in. Well, not this place specifically, but another one. Max and his beloved diner were in Buckeye Falls. The diner, which didn't even have a proper name, was the focal point of her hometown's food scene. Her hometown was so small, its most popular restaurant didn't even need a name. The diner, which some days felt like the real love of Max's life, was going to haunt her. Deep down, Ginny knew she shouldn't begrudge her ex's success as he likely wouldn't begrudge her hers. While tapping her fingers on the countertop, she battled a metric ton of rolling emotions. Frankly, she wasn't sure how far to delve into these thoughts. It seemed dangerous, like poking a hibernating bear, but through Ginny's musings, one fact stuck out to her the most. She was curious how Max was doing. Was he happy? Was the diner the success she assumed it was? Did he miss her? Had he met someone? Wait, she, she certainly didn't care if he did. That changed nothing in her mind. And yet, yeah, she was so not ready for a Buckeye, Buckeye Falls reunion. Ready or not, here I come, she sighed to herself. Aside from wanting to avoid a certain dining establishment, Ginny's palms slipped with sweat for a bigger reason as she grew nearer to her destination. She hadn't reached out to tell Max she was coming back, even if only temporarily. Despite her plans to avoid the diner, word traveled fast, and she'd be outed in no time. She knew she couldn't hide forever, but damn, did she want to. After they divorced, the pair hadn't stayed in touch. It felt foolish to reach out with her plans after all this time. Her plans weren't his concern. Practicing her breathing exercises, Jenny leaned back and inhaled deeply, centering herself. Even though it was foolish to think she could control the outcome of her visit, she tried to picture the perfect stress-free trip home. She would avoid Max at all costs and would focus on her father. There was no reason to hope old, open old wounds and check in with her ex. Nope, Max was none of her concern business anymore. Now she just had to convince her heart that he was old news. Max Sanchez wiped his brow with the corner of his apron. The dinnertime rush was murder on Sundays. Takeout orders for family dinners were his biggest business, which kept him up to his elbows in pie crusts and roast beef. How much chili do we have left? About six cups, four if Evan is serving, Cece yelled over the din of the bustling kitchen. She was also sweating in the heat of the cramped space, but her eyes were laser focused on the orders in front of her. Max could always count on her. Evan, his newest rate waiter, stumbled into the kitchen and slammed his tray on the counter. I heard that, he grumbled as he dipped the ladle into the bowl. It's not my fault that I want to give the customers generous portions. Max bit back a grin and shook his head. I wouldn't worry about us being too generous, but it's our busiest night, so try not to give out bowls when customers order cups. Trying to be diplomatic with Evan and Cece was difficult because Max liked them both so much. Cece was a trained pastry chef, and Evan was just getting started on his own. Max strived to keep the peace as often as he could, especially in his own kitchen. 
When Evan was out of earshot, Cece leaned over the counter toward Max. We better get out the soup we made for tomorrow. Helen said there's a line out the door, and that's not counting the takeout orders. Max agreed with her, but turned his attention back to his station. Dozens of plates waited for their meals, but Max was slow on his feet tonight. When Harold called that morning, it threw Max for a loop. He knew his ex-father-in-law was having surgery soon, but he didn't know who would be coming to take care of him. Of course, it made sense that Ginny was coming home to help. Harold was her only family. It surprised Max how much it gutted him that she hadn't reached out on her own. Much like the dwindling pot of chili, Max's relationship with Ginny needed attention before there was nothing left to salvage. He missed her deep in his core, but he didn't know how to reach out and tell her. Deep down, he knew it wouldn't make a difference. There were ample reasons they were no longer together, all of which Ginny would happily recite to him as soon as they saw each other. But that was the problem. They never saw each other. Over the last two years, Ginny had avoided Buckeye Falls like the plague. He'd heard through the local grapevine when she was visiting Harold, but she never stopped by the diner, not, never even called to see how he was doing. There wasn't even so much as a birthday text. Max never asked Harold, but he was sure that Ginny didn't know her father and he were still close. Even after all this time, Max couldn't believe how little he knew about the most important woman in his life. A rough year in their marriage erased years of friendship and love. If, if he allowed it, Max knew he could stay up for days obsessing about what went wrong, who was to blame, and how he'd missed the cues that he'd been on thin ice. He wasn't too proud to admit he'd bored his former father-in-law one too many times on the subject. Poor Harold. Tuesdays, when they were closed, Max would go to Harold's and make dinner. They would watch whatever game was on TV and talk about the good old days. Even though Ginny wasn't around, Max could see her in the details of the old house. From pictures on the mantle to the stories and updates Harold would share, Max knew enough to feel like he still knew his wife. Well, his ex-wife. The most important thing he knew was that she was still single. That tidbit shouldn't put Max at ease, but it did. Knowing there wasn't a special man in Jenny's life let a tiny kernel of hope bloom in his chest. Didn't matter what the Ohio court said, Jenny still felt like his wife. Of course, he'd tried going on a couple of dates. Those stilted outings were awkward and uncomfortable, and he always felt like he was cheating. It was taking far too long for his heart to get the memo that his brain had accepted long ago. Much like that last serving of chilling, Max was falling solo. Did you hear what I said? Cece asked, a pair of tongs pointed towards Max's torso. Shaking his head, Max cleared his throat. No, sorry, what was that? He tossed a handful of parsley onto a plate and slid it to the edge of the counter for Evan. Make sure you add an extra pat of butter for Mrs. Henderson, he ordered. Cece put her hands on her hips and stared down at her boss. I said we're almost out of hash browns. Do you mean to start new ones or tell folks it's home fries? Max wiped his hands on his apron, stalling. Things were getting too busy for his head not to be in the game, and he hated to waste time on chopping potatoes. Let's go with the home fries. Tonight, potatoes are potatoes. Cece nodded, but she arched an eyebrow at Max. Will do. Before she stepped away, she lowered her voice and asked, Do you want to talk about it? Max stopped chopping, his knife raised in the air. About hash browns? Groaning, Cece shook her head. No, about the real reason you're not listening. I heard a certain city slicker is headed back to Buckeye Falls. If you don't mind me saying, it's messing with your mojo tonight. Max wouldn't give Cece the satisfaction of admitting defeat. I don't know what you're talking about. And why are you talking like we're in an old-time western? Cece rolled her eyes and pulled a bin of hash browns from the chiller drawer. If you want to play coy with me, that's fine. You're the boss. I think it would be healthier to talk about your feelings instead of not chopping enough potatoes at the beginning of our shift. Max knew she was right, but his pride got the better of him. If Ginny is back in town, that's her business. Hardly has anything to do with me. As soon as the lie was off his lips, his knife skidded and nicked his thumb. Mumbling a slew of obscenities, he ran to the sink in the first aid kit. The cut was tiny, but the lack of focus frustrated him. This was nothing, an honest slip-up. Damn, now he was stuttering. Max closed his eyes and tried counting back from ten. Frustrations were high, and that's when his old nemesis liked to come out and play. His stutter was hardly a well-kept secret, but he had been so good at controlling it. Fortunately, Cece was familiar with his problem and was kind enough to change the subject. If you're okay, I'll go help Evan take orders. She hitched a thumb at the now full prep station. We're set here for now. Max met her gaze and smiled, truly happy in that moment to have such a good friend on his team. Cece and Max didn't always see eye to eye in the kitchen, but he knew she had his back. Thanks. 
he said, pulling his attention to his bandaged finger. Tell the Martins that their steaks are almost ready. With a nod, Cece disappeared into the dining room, leaving Max alone with a throbbing thumb and a million racing thoughts. Could he survive a visit from Jenny? More importantly, could he survive not seeing her while she was in Buckeye Falls? They had been a couple for over a decade and friends for a lot longer than that. It seemed so cold and hurtful to avoid each other now. Harold was going to have surgery and Max knew his friend was worried. Recovery time, prepping the house for his recovery, there were a lot of moving pieces. Back when they were family emergencies during their marriage, they were a team. If Ginny zigged, Max would zag. Now it felt all wrong, like he was watching his old life play out without him. He liked to help the people who were important to him, but he knew he wasn't welcome anymore. That stung. It shouldn't after two years, but it still did. Come and see me, he muttered to himself. Don't be a stranger, Jim. Squaring his shoulders, Max went back to the matter at hand and finished searing steaks. The diners were counting on him, and he would never let them down. <laughs>